Thanks a million, Lewis. Well, this is just terrific, a full house. Uh, and wasn't that a wonderful lecture by Esther as well? Uh, oh, my timer started. But I, I, I want to start, I, I, you know, people are talking about leaping into the future. And, and before we do that, maybe we can just skip uh, a little bit into the past. And I just want to focus together as a family here on, on just one year. And let's just focus just a few years ago on, on the not too distant past, 2009. I want you to think about this year and uh, think about what it means to you. But I'm going to tell you that this was probably the most important year in any of our lives, indeed as a species, because, because of this. Because for the first time in the history of us, more folks died from non-infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, things like cancer, things like heart disease, diabetes, and others, than from all the plagues in the world combined. So think about that, because that is going to change everything, and it's doing that right now, and I think it forces us uh, to take on something of a, of a new way of looking at the world, maybe a new world view. And, and if we're going to do that, maybe we can kind of break it down like this, uh, like Steve Jones uh, uh, did, looking at how we, how we leave this world. Sometimes, I think, tells us a lot about how we live on the world. And, and we can divide that maybe into three epochs. The first way that we've died through the eons was through accidents and disaster. And it still plagues us today to some extent, but we got smart, we moved into villages and, and, and cities, and we stopped dying so much from those, a disaster, and we started dying from disease. Pick your plague. And we still, far too many people are dying from, unnecessarily from, from diseases. But now we move from disaster to disease, and now in 2009 a line was crossed, and now it's all about, if we can go back to the beginning. Keep going. Decay. <laughs> so, if we're going to have strategies to deal with this, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to work around this? And I can maybe think of, of maybe three basic strategies to deal with this. Uh, the first is, is this way. Maybe we can just say, okay, to decay. Maybe it's just the natural order of things and we can just acquiesce. I think that's pretty reasonable. Uh, it's, we just, we'll just sort of waste away. Uh, but maybe we can move on and disobey decay. That's another possible strategy. It seems to me to be a bit too hubristic, though, maybe a, a little bit too cheeky. And maybe we can triangulate and split the difference, and maybe we can delay decay. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to delay decay, that seems to be a little bit more humble, with a little bit more humility, maybe a little bit more potential. And so if we're going to do that as a family and explore that, maybe we can uh, tour Tomorrowland today. And uh, this is sounding like a Dr. Seuss TED Talk. Uh, so, but if we're going to do that, let's make one stop on our tour of Tomorrowland together. And, and that's going to be uh, an app store, kind of a human app store, if you will. And we're seeing now just an unprecedented, it's, it's such an awesome time because uh, we're seeing this merger of consumer technology with medical devices like, like never before. And it's an, it's an extraordinary thing because what's happening now is we see these, this panoply of technologies uh, existing, uh, thousands of medical apps now that are proliferating that are right in your pocket now, but we can divide these things, let's just simplify into maybe two basic kinds of technologies. Things from things that monitor you, like this, these sleep monitors. I'm sure many of you have been playing around with these if you have an iPhone or an Android or something along those lines. That's pretty cool. They can, it can kind of coax you into a little bit better sleep habits. That's one kind of app. We can divide it into the other kind of app, which is this kind of thing. This is a live core, which is a really cool device. It gives you a little precordial lead, and you can look at potentially dangerous arrhythmias, and it'll tell you when that's dangerous and maybe when you ought to go in and see your doc. So these are the two kinds of things. You can really divide them into something like this, like, a, like an alarm system, maybe a car alarm uh, for, uh, for your body. Or, and then when you have a car alarm, you've got to marry that with a, with a Prius, naturally. And, uh, and the other kinds are, are Priuses for your body, the things that, 
instead of telling you there's danger or something that might coax you into a little bit better fuel economy, like your Prius, maybe it'll coax you into a little bit better health economy. So if we put together the car alarm and the Prius, don't we then, you know, naturally, the next step is to think about uh, Thomas Hobbes. And, uh, and, and, and so, and Thomas, back in the day, uh, suggested that, he, he argued that we have to have a social contract uh, with our elected or unelected government so that our lives won't be nasty, won't be brutish, won't be short. And, and I would suggest to you now that we have to have a new, rewritten uh, social sort of cyber contract, if you will, so our lives together as a family and our families' lives won't be nasty, brutish, and long, and if you will. And so maybe we can live up until we die. And maybe we can do that not in the hospital, like you've heard, no matter how happy a place that is, <laughs> but, but, but at home, where I think maybe we're all happier. And I think that might be a good way forward. But if we're going to do this, I think we have to, I think we have, to have some, some strategies to go forward if we're going to, if we're going to uh, uh, hold on to all these data ourselves and take control of this. I think we've got to get smart. And so if we're going to get smart, there's, uh, the, uh, as we move into uh, uh, moving from hospital to home and monitoring, there's just a whole wealth of technologies. And I credit my, uh, one of my partners, uh, Bijan Najafi, who I think is in the audience, with so many of the technologies that we're working on. But we have smart textiles now and smart jewelry and smart pendants now that can monitor our activities. And when you start to do that, it's astonishing. I mean, we have devices like this from our lab that can tell you when you're running, you're jumping, you're kind of skipping, crawling, begging for mercy. It can tell you when, whatever you're doing, uh, as you see here. But what's really cool is that that gives us, we can, we can do some signal processing on that and we can start seeing what essentially is something of a, of a, of a barcode or even an ECG for our activity. And it starts to take on these phenotypes of activity. And now we can tell our patient and we tell ourselves, instead of, I've fallen and I can't get up now millions of times every year, it's you're about to fall and you're about not to get up. And we can predict these, these, these dangerous activities before they ever happen, and we can co uh, coach our patients to do that. So that's one way to do it. What's another thing? Naturally, if we talk about shirts and pendants, we've got to talk about socks. So uh, smart socks at the other end of the body. What we have now is unprecedented again, these fiber optic filled socks that you can throw in the wash and everything. They're not yet in the bin at Target, but they're close. And, and but they can monitor skin temperature and predict potentially dangerous gangrene and people with diabetes. So we can prevent the one amputation that occurs every 20 seconds now around the world before it ever happens. It could also predict when a joint is going to fail based on its, uh, its angle and base of motion. This is really fascinating, actually. And then these devices are communicating with our own happy place at home and, 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 the, and the smart home where we're communicating with other appliances like bath mats and carpets and other things. Even some of our video game systems that are able to monitor activity are all now speaking uh, to us in a way that we could we've never did before. And, and I think what we're going to start to see now is just like we pay for our Hulu or our Netflix or our cable bill, we're going to be paying subscriptions for things like this, I would imagine. And I think what we're going to start seeing now is a home right now that may have more gadgetry and technology in it than a telemetry unit in a hospital did just a couple of years ago. And it's just really, really exciting. And, and that leads us now to what's next. So if we're moving beyond just the, uh, th this technology that we're uh, wearing and, uh, and moving on. Maybe we can enhance who we are and what we are, and that leads us to these cybernetic devices. Now, the most common kind of cybernetic device, if you will, uh, it would be some glasses. They might help you uh, function a little bit better, or a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, but naturally, when you think glasses, hearing aid, the next thing you think about is um, a, you know, a wearable robot. And uh, that's the next step. And so with that, and they have really cool names now, like Hal, that's a cool name, Rex, you know, these sorts of powerful male 
testosterone names, but the hybrid-assisted limb is, is a technology that exists right now, and it's for sale and in, a, in a nursing home near you, if your nursing home is in, in Tokyo. But, the, the, but what you see here now, but this woman now, the, these folks are taking their first unassisted steps now in years because you have a technology that can amplify an intended signal down in the periphery uh, and then move with actuators and accelerometers to assist uh, the, the, the patient. So that's really exciting. And, and not to be outdone, uh, there are studies now going on uh, in, uh, in Chicago now from colleagues of ours at Rehab Institute of Chicago with a walk assist device. This uh, is made naturally by the same people that make riding lawnmowers and accords. It's made by Honda. No kidding. So buckle up. Maybe uh, that's coming to you too. No airbag on this. But so from this, we now move on to really we have to start asking ourselves as we start having this, these, these technologies move closer, farther and farther into us and, and around us, what is it that really makes us, us? And, and when we think about it, you know, most of us in our pockets, uh, I don't have mine on now, I put mine over there, but we, we have our phones in our pockets. And if I were to ask some of you, if I were to ask some of my trainees, what would you rather give up, your kidney or your phone? Because it's redundant, you know, the... the the, the, the kidney. Uh, they, 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 I think many people, most people probably, you know, and, and, and what we see now here is, is, is the phone is, is so, it's, it's another organ, isn't it? And so we have a few things that we can do uh, with this, and, and, but why can't it just merge? And, and you need a few things. You need a screen, uh, you, or an input method, you need a screen, and you need a computer and memory. So let's move on that. So first, the uh, uh, the, the input system, and you see this uh, really happy, happy, joy, joy, kind of everyone uh, entering through Siri. It's a happy land where everything works. All right, and uh, we know it's not as perfect as that anymore, but it's getting better, right? We can input now with our voice, and it's getting better through other types of technologies. So that's our input device, if we're going to start merging the phone with us. But what about a screen? Well, you've heard about Google Glasses, but Forget the Google Glass. I want these contact lenses now because this is, these are colleagues of ours at the uh, uh, University of Washington. And you see this really cool device, which is an antenna uh, 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 on, the, on the periphery, Wi-Fi, connected to a big screen TV right in the center. Uh, and, uh, and, and this can communicate then uh, with, with your phone and with a, and with a computer. So that's your, that's your screen. So instead of getting your contact lenses at LensCrafters, it's going to be Best Buy pretty soon. So buckle up for that. So what about the third thing? Now we want the memory, and here we go, memory engineering. And this is just mind-blowing. So, uh, because you can buy this stuff now. You know these devices, the various types of things you can wear, you kind of look a little geeky, but it's recording everything around you. Uh, these are really hot Christmas gifts, and this is a version of this that's kind of an always-on kind of thing. Look, you're looking around, isn't it a pretty blue sky? It's kind of a drab building. What's going on with this bus? Oh, that's a lawyer's ad. What is the number to that lawyer on the side of that bus? I couldn't read it. No problem. I'll just rewind when I get home. That is a, is a game changer, isn't it? Because if you think about it, these, this ubiquitous recording is, is, is happening now as we record everything about our lives. And if we're the sum of our memories and we have these always-on technologies, what if? What if our memories were never summarized? And instead of walking with a, you know, down memory lane, we were walking with a super highway of memory. And we were evolving with this gadget in our pocket or on us or in us. And this is, these are profound kind of Talmudic questions that we're not going to answer in this talk. But let's, let's move on beyond that to merging everything. Uh, and, 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 machine augmented cognition, because this is happening now in a lab near you, and pretty soon maybe beyond that. So, so what, 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 are, what am I talking about now? We're talking about brain-computer interfaces, and, and, and so what we see now is that these technologies, there are technologies that can be placed superficially on the brain, and with a brain scan to identify activity, and then with the intention, as, as it's magnified from analog to digital back to analog again, one could bypass a damaged spinal cord and move something inanimate or animate in, uh, 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 at a distance. And then what that leads to is this. And this is a woman that is, is, is paralyzed, and for the first time ever, with that brain-computer interface behind her, she is controlling that, hand, that robotic hand, 
and she's taken a sip, and this is now where it stops being engineering, it stops being medicine, and it just starts being magic. And, and it's happening now, and it's just, it's just mind-blowing. Uh, and, and so why not move then? Well, what if that arm wasn't just in front of her? What if it was a, a, a thousand miles away? And that's avatars, naturally. And, and what you can see here now is that there are technologies, uh, now this is from Tai Chi University and colleagues in Tai Chi, that uh, can actually, uh, that has a that sense of temperature and, uh, and touch, and, and one can now communicate uh, with this through a wearable robot themselves, but pretty soon now a brain-computer interface, and be moving these things at a distance. Imagine telecommuting this way rather than the normal way. Uh, I, I, and perhaps that's happening in the future as well. But finally, what about this? What about getting up inside someone's head? And, and, and think about this now. If one com brain computer interface is good, maybe two are better. So let's double our pleasure. So this is just the coolest darn thing in the world. And, and, and we can't, so what you, what you see here is a guy with his back turned uh, to you, and he is playing a video game. And that's, and what has just happened now is a gentleman in the room right next to him and we has, has just actuated through an analog to digital and analog signal. A, he thought about uh, firing, uh, firing a, uh, a little a fake uh, a gun in a video game and the man with the brain computer interface attached to him has just fired. What's happened now? This guy's playing Angry Birds with his back to the screen. And, and this is an amazing time now where one can communicate one thought and that can communicate uh, into an action potential on the other end. So, ladies and gentlemen, there's so much going on now that's extraordinarily mind-blowing, but I'm just going to conclude with this. Uh, you know, when I think about all of these technologies and, and where they're headed and now and, 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 and in the future, I naturally, like you, think of Blaise Pascal. And, and, and Blaise has a great name and, you know, sounds like a skateboarder. Uh, Blaze, but but what what he said was what, what we all feel is that, uh, that that knowledge is like a sphere, and, and the greater its volume, the larger its contact with the unknown. And what we have are, are these unprecedented changes in medicine and biotech, and 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 neuroscience and and engineering, and all these things are moving out at light speed, and and. And what we have to do ourselves as a family is collect these things and put energy into the system in order to put these things into fun, uh, fundamental building blocks where we can build on all of these things and make a difference. And I think we can, and I think that's happening right now. And, and I think if we put these things together, we can make a difference for all of us, no matter what our health, no matter what our age. And ladies and gentlemen, I think it's that fundamental desire to build on things and to learn from each other and to make a difference. And it's that ambition to move forward that really, at the end of the day, makes us, us. And with that, I thank you so much.